Good morning. Our lesson today has to do with freedom in Christ. And of course this is here because of the 4th of July this past week. I hope all of you had a wonderful, safe 4th of July. There's a note in the bulletin about a family that did not have a good July 4th. And I'm so sorry. Uh, they, they touched the lives of people here in Henry County. And he has preached at Springville a couple of times. He's held meetings at Cottage Grove, well, the, the granddaddy has. And so just wonderful people. We need to acknowledge the 4th of July as Christians, uh, the significance of it, because it is a huge, huge day. And usually what we do is we just pass it off without ever doing a whole lot. Uh, maybe you get together with family, maybe you cut a watermelon, freeze some ice cream, do some eating like that, you know, and that's pretty good stuff. But it really means something to us. It's a celebration of our independence. And if you've never been outside this nation, you don't really know how to appreciate what we have here in the United States of America. I'm telling you, I, I've had guns held to me in visiting in the airports, places by guards. I've had uh, guards to keep their people from getting on the plane that I was on because they wanted to get out. All kinds of things that you can't even believe. And we don't have that. At least we don't have it yet. It's our Declaration of Independence. Uh, it was signed in uh, 1776 by the Second Continental Congress. And the signing started on July the 4th. I don't think the last one signed it until July the 13th. But I may be wrong on that. But best I remember, that's the truth. We were determined, we were, de <laughs> we were declared to be states. We had been colonies, 13 colonies, but we declared to be states, and we were free from King George in Britain. And, you know, Britain's a pretty good co country. I got a text from Britain this morning. Uh, Charlie Mitchell, I got a text from your son Ray this morning. And he said, tell you Hello. <laughs> we have the greatest nation on earth and I mean it's uh, it's God given and you can question that if you want to but I want you to know the freedoms that we have and the morality that has been ours it's going rapidly down the tubes it seems but it has been a country that has been under God in his hand. And our freedom is the envy of all people. And the proof is the illegals that are trying to get in here. That's all you got to do. Look at your TV and watch those illegals come in here by the droves. Because everyone wants what you have. And this lesson this morning, if it does anything, I want it to impress upon you the freedoms, the liberty. There is a greater nation than this one, and it is the kingdom of Christ. And I want to impress upon you not only the freedoms we have in this country, but also the freedoms that we have in Jesus in the church. I want to start with Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. And I want you to know I'm taking this out of context. Okay? He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now that passage goes on to talk about what he's talking about really is freedom from the old law. That's not what we are, but I'm going to mention that too later on to show you how precious that is. We want to examine the word liberty or free, whichever you want to take. And the principles that are in the New Testament that actually say, you are free. And the first one I want to deal with is freedom from sin. I don't know about you. But all the time I'm having to say, God forgive me for that. Usually it's a fault. 
God, forgive me for an action. Forgive me for some word. Forgive me some, from some deed. I'm always having to ask God to forgive me. I don't know about you, but this is huge in my life, and that's why I've got it number one. In Romans chapter 6, verse 70 through 18, Paul says, But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. And I want to dwell for a moment on the word were. It means that you are no longer a servant of sin. It means you used to be a servant of sin. It means that does not describe you now. So, I sin. What do you mean, Paul? Well, what Paul means is, I no longer have a lifestyle that serves the world. Yeah, I make mistakes. Yeah, I do err. Yeah, I'm weak. Yeah, I, all those kinds. Yes, I do those things. But Paul is talking about a lifestyle where I turn my back on the Lord, I go away from Him, I go back into the world, and I live just like there wasn't a Christ. I live just like there is no God. That's not you people. So let us thank God. I was, I used to be, we were the servants of sin, but not any longer. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Hmm. When you quote the prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples as the Lord's prayer, that is a form. What Jesus means for you to do is to take that and to expand on it so that it pertains particularly to you. In this passage, he has another form in mind. This is from the 6th chapter, verses 17 through 18, and the form he gave you in verses 1 through 6. You were baptized into his death. You were, like as he was raised, so you were raised to walk in the newness of life. And so, when I was buried with him, I wasn't actually dying, but I was following the form. And your baptism was a form of what Jesus did to save your souls. You obeyed from the heart. It required your heart to give in. Lord, what must I do? They said on the day of Pentecost. And that's what he told them to do. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. You obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine that was delivered you. And look what else he says. Being then made free from sin. At what point, Paul, when you obeyed the form of doctrine that was delivered to you, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, which is the gospel, that is when you were made free from sin. Oh, I should have put you at writing down the rest of that, but that you got too much to write anyway today. Then you became the servants of righteousness. You were freed from sin, but you became God's slave. You're free from all the condemnation of sin. You're free from the problems of sin, but you are God's slave to do what things that are right. That's something to be thankful for, y'all. When Jesus told them that if they come unto him, he would give them rest. He also said something else. My yoke is easy. 
my servitude, my slavery is easy and it's light. It's not hard to be a Christian. It's not hard to serve God. But it means that our mind must be re-prepared or, or reshaped so that it doesn't follow the world, but it follows the righteousness because that's what we are to serve. That which is right in the sight of God. That's not all. We also are free from the law. That's what Galatians was talking about when I first read that passage earlier. Galatians chapter 5, I believe it was. In Romans chapter 7, verse 6, he says, But now are we delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. We'll finish that verse in a minute. First, make no mistake about it. You are delivered from the old law. Hmm. Do you mean it's okay for me to steal now? No. It's not okay for you to steal now. But it's not okay for you to steal now, not because the old law said don't steal, but because you're a servant of righteousness and it's right for you not to steal. When you were under the old law, this passage says, spiritually, you were dead. Had no life in you. And you offered to God dead sacrifices. God didn't want that anymore. What God wants now is the sacrifice of yourself. That's chapter 12. This is before chapter 12. Chapter 12 says, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your personal worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. That you may be able to show it. Why? Because I'm delivered from the old law. I was held captive. I had a cousin who died this past year. And he used to get on top of me and get me down and tickle me. Yeah. He would tickle me until I did some things uh, biologically that uh, had to go get cleaned up for. Yeah, I loved him. But I didn't like that being held down. Where I couldn't do anything to stop him from tickling me. I didn't like that. And I'd scream. That's the situation. You were held by that old law. You were dead. There was nothing you could do about it. You were separated from God by your sins. And that's the way it was. Whew. Now, Lord, we've been released from that old law that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Very important concept here. In the Old Testament, Israel was the people of God. And we usually just transfer that and say, now Christians are the people of God. That's true, but that's so shallow. That doesn't even touch what it is. In that day, you served God according to the letter of of the law. He even carved part of it out in stone for you. You do this or else. There were all kinds of punishments. The, some of those punishments were you'd be kicked out of Israel. If you don't do what the law says, you're done for. 
part of those the law was you can be stoned to death. Part of that law says that you offer an extra sacrifice. Two turtle doves, two pigeons, a ram, or a, a lamb. Because you've done something you shouldn't do. That's not it anymore. Thank you, God. Those things are expensive. <laughs> I don't know what a turtle dove costs now, but it's more than I want to pay, I'm sure. But now it's in the spirit. I present my body as a living sacrifice unto God. I am freed from that old law. I no longer serve according to the oldness of the letter, but I serve by the spirit. He is my father. He is my father. Oh, that makes me his son. And the father loves the son. And the Father cares for the Son. And the Father forgives the Son. And the Father loves all over me. It is not the old letter. You do this, you die. No. The prodigal son. I don't care what you did. Just come home. Just come home. That's something to be thankful for, y'all. That's something to be thankful for. Then there's a freedom from fear. <clears throat> there are lots of things that I might have a fear of. And what I'm not too sure on the safety of handling those guns. Okay? There is a, a great deal of respect and some fear in that handling. But there are some things that you don't have to be afraid of that you're used to. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's an attitude, a mind of, however you want to term it. God didn't make you afraid. Do you fear? Do you fear government? God says they're his arm to maintain social order. Do you fear man? Jesus says don't fear what man can do for, uh, to you, but fear what God could do to you. Do you fear death? Jesus came forth from the grave to show you this is not all there is to it. There are some other examples that God has given us to show us this is not all there is to it. Do you remember the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appeared? And Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And Moses and Elijah were still living. Do you remember the example of Lazarus? Lazarus come forth. He wasn't dead. He heard the voice of Jesus. And he came forth. Do you remember the example of the rich man and Lazarus? It's a different Lazarus, but the rich man of La and Lazarus. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom and the rich man was in torment. Do you remember that? We don't go out of existence when we die. We are alive. Do not fear. But God has given us the power of love and of a sound mind. Power. Last week we looked at that power. It's the power that God put in us with the Holy Spirit. It's the same power that raised him up from the dead. And you have power to address the Father and to ask him for whatever you want. And if you believe it's going to happen, guess what? The 
Bible says it will. You've been given the power of love. That's what this address is here. I am free to love you and to love God. And the sound mind, well, your mind is probably a little bit better than mine. But you know what? I can figure out that there is a God and that is a sound mind to know that there is a God. A person who does not figure out that there is a God is a person who is not looking around them. They're not seeing the evidence and they're not seeing what God has given them for them to see Him. You're here this morning and it's because you see Him. You know He's real. You know He's here. And you came here to love on Him. Don't be afraid of Him. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, the Bible says, For as much sin as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Do you know why he did that? So he'd understand you. That's one, just one of the reasons. But it is a reason, and it's a good reason. He became flesh and blood so he could understand you. That's what the book of Hebrews says on later. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Do you see he's tied this coming to flesh in with death. Jesus had to die to be the sacrifice for us. But Jesus had to die in order to understand death for you. And he's saying to you and me, don't fear. Because verse 15 says, And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. One of the reasons he came was to understand us. One of the reasons he came was to show us, don't be afraid of this thing, death. It is the doorway by which God takes you into eternity. That's all it is. You will never go unconscious. You just open your eyes in eternity. And everybody's going to see him. I read a lot of testimonials on this. A lot of them are Christians. And one after another, they would say, I'm a Christian, but I still am afraid of death. Jesus came and died to free us from that fear. This passage says so. And I want you to think about Jesus. He came here not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John chapter 3. Are you afraid of Jesus? When he came to save you? When he came, he called you his friend? He came and he calls you his child? He calls you his brother? Are you afraid of your brother? And time after again, those people would say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Don't be afraid of him. In Christ, there is no condemnation. If you are a Christian, listen to this carefully. If you're a Christian and you're trying to serve the Lord, you will not be condemned. There is not a chance anywhere of you being condemned. If you put Romans chapter 8, which says there is no condemnation now, to those who are in Christ Jesus, 
couple it with Romans chapter 4. And it says not only will God not condemn you, chapter 8, but chapter 4 says he will not charge you with any sin. That's huge. Don't be afraid. And Jesus over and over again told his disciples, fear not. It's me. It's I. In the language of the King James says, and it's Jesus who's going to come again. And he's going to come. Preachers like to quote, he's coming with vengeance. To take, take vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel. That's not you. That's not you. He's coming again, all right. And he's coming to do that, all right. But he's coming for you to take you home with him. That's what he's coming for. And lastly, freedom to, to live in the Spirit. That comes from Romans chapter 8 as well, and we'll just quote it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 is one, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. I read it over and over again. I guess you see I've already referred to it about four times in this scripture. I think I've got one more to go. I think there's five times. There's no condemnation in Christ. In order for you to stay in that vein of no condemnation, it says you don't live a lifestyle. You don't walk after the flesh. You don't live like the world does. You're different. But you live after the leadership of the Spirit. Later on in this chapter, he's going to say, and those who are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For the law of the Spirit of life it's made me free. I am free from sin. I am free from death. God will not charge me. He will not condemn me. That's what this passage says. So I just keep trying to serve God. And I have hope. That is more than hope. It is a promise from the God who cannot lie. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And you can just go on and on and on. We can carry this lesson a lot longer. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Going back to Galatians where we started. Galatians chapter 5. Freedom to love and serve others. You my brothers and sisters. We're called to be free. We're called by the gospel. But what that gospel calls us to. Is Jesus. But when we get to Jesus. We get freedom. Now, it's not freedom to live as you want, but to be led by the Spirit. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another in humbly and in love. I'm free. I'm called to be free. But I can't use the freedom to sin. Here's... Here's the problem in my heart as a man. Freedom from sin means, Charlie, I can just do whatever I want to do. I can sin however I want to. Do you remember what Romans 6 says? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, that God can just give us more grace? God forbid. God forbids. Here it is again. Do not indulge in the flesh, but serve one another humbly and in love. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. I think that's the ESV version. I'm not sure. Uh, I use so many in working on this. Live as free people. Don't cover up evil. So let's bring it together. Freedom in Christ should bring joy in our living. I mean, it just should change everything. God, thank you for the freedoms you've given us from sin and from the law and all those old sacrifices and all that stuff. Thank you for the freedom to serve you in righteousness and to serve one another in love. We got the old things of law, they don't apply to us anymore. I am so glad I don't have to go get the best bull in the county and offer it up to God. I don't know what a bull costs now. A man who died two years ago I remember about five years ago, he bought a bull. It was a prize bull. He paid $2 million for that bull. That's the standard of bull that you have to give under the old law. Thank you, God. We don't have to do that. There are problems brought on by sin. Yeah, sometimes I might have to go to jail. I might have to do some things like that. But the problems I'm talking about here, that we are, they're averted. We don't have those anymore. My guilt. My depression from my sin. My dire need to fix something and I can't fix it. It's averted because Jesus takes that sin away. But in that freedom he gives us the hope of heaven. And it's held in our hearts. Do you look forward to being with God? And as a Christian, there's only one answer you can give for that. And if your mind is not set yet to give that yes answer, then you need to do a little more reading in your scripture. That's where your faith comes from. Fear the world. Fear not what man shall do to you. Will it hurt? It can. Can it kill you? Yep. So what? I'm going to be with him. So, we're free. We live in a spirit free from any yoke. Not of the letter, but in a relationship. We're connected to God in the body of Christ. That's the church. We're connected one to another. We learn to love one another, to care for one another. And God approves us by the blood of Jesus. And when he looks at me and he looks at you as Christians, he does not look at us in our sin. He looks at us covered in the blood of Jesus. And we're destined for heaven.